Thank you very much for that introduction. The first test for me of the technology is whether I've unmuted this microphone. I think I have. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Good. Um, now, the tradition of these lunchtime lectures is they run absolutely to time. We've actually started one minute early. Um, but we promise to finish at 1.55. And I promise to try and finish my talk at 1.45 to allow lots of time for questions and discussion. I'm going to cover a lot of ground rather quickly. 20 slides in about 30 minutes. So forgive me, I can see some experts amongst the audience um, if we skate over rather a lot of things rather lightly. Um, but you're welcome to pursue those things when we get to the discussion. In the introduction, um, uh, briefly, let me add my credentials, as it were, for talking to you today. Last year, in the Constitution Unit, we did a lot of work on hung parliaments, and we published a report in December in partnership with the Institute for Government, whose subtitle was The Challenges for Westminster and Whitehall. And you will remember, uh, in the three or four months before the election, when the opinion polls began to turn, uh, and it became clear that there might be a hung parliament, uh, there was then a lot of detailed planning, contingency planning in Whitehall for that possible eventuality. And in February, the Cabinet Office published a draft chapter of a new Cabinet manual, a chapter entitled Elections and Government Formation. Uh, and very timely for today's lecture, Sir Gus O'Donnell, the Cabinet Secretary, only this morning, <laughs> was giving evidence to a common select committee about the contents of that new cabinet manual. And I was one of a small number of constitutional experts consulted about the cabinet manual. Um, and since the election and the formation of the new coalition government, I followed developments very, very closely. And indeed, I hope to do a detailed research study of the new coalition government and how it works. But that all depends on a research funding proposal, um, which I submitted uh, back in the spring, and which will be determined tomorrow. So all of you, please keep your fingers crossed for me um, for our grant application tomorrow. Now, let's see. Ah, here we go. This is what I'm hoping to cover in 30 minutes. So the first big question, are hung parliaments here to stay? Is this a flash in the pan? Or is this a uh, harbinger of things to come? Then to talk about the stability of coalition government. And I'm going to talk about the stability of coalition governments in general. And then focus in on this one in particular and its prospects. And I'm going to talk about three of the early political reforms that the new government is planning to introduce. And indeed, they have already introduced two bills into parliament um, on these topics, on fixed term parliaments the referendum on electoral reform that they hope to hold in the spring, and their plans to reduce the size of the House of Commons. And the conclusion that I'm building up to is that the serious risks of failure for one or more of those political reforms may threaten the coalition itself. So starting then with our hung parliaments here to stay. And this first side shows how dominant was the two-party system. Uh, look up there. When in the 1950s, Labour and Conservatives, the two main parties combined, regularly polled 95% of the popular vote. But in my lifetime, that has gradually declined until at the last election, 2010, they got only 65% of the popular vote. What had happened? Well, a third party, the Liberals, now the Lib Dems, have got about 25% of the vote. And minor parties, half a dozen of them, have gradually crept up so that they, between them, are getting about 10% of the vote. And here's that same information in words. And these are the results from the last election. The Lib Dems, uh, who it's thought didn't do very well, in fact, by historic standards, did very well in the last election. 
It was only that after the Clegg bounce with the televised debates, they didn't do uh, quite as well as people had expected. But they got their second best result ever, and indeed they got 1% more of the vote than they had in 2005. And the minor parties between them, as I've said, polled 10%, and I've put them in order uh, of their importance in terms of share of the vote. UKIP uh, got 3%, the BNP got 2%, uh, the SNP uh, just under 2%, etc. cetera. And the result of the gradual incursions of the Lib Dems and the minor parties is that in the last four parliaments, there have been at least 75 MPs who've been neither Labour nor Conservative and therefore hung parliaments, all the electoral experts say, are more likely in the future. And if that proves to be the case, we are in effect joining the rest of Europe, where hung parliaments are the norm. And intriguingly, coalition governments are also the norm, because all those countries with, with diagonal lines are countries with coalition government. Note, there are very few countries with single-party majority government, in fact, only four, uh, Spain, Portugal, Greece, and Hungary. Note another interesting thing, which is the ideological composition of those coalition governments, because this coloring of green and blue is to denote conservative liberal coalitions. And there is an arc of countries across northwestern Europe, nine countries in all, which have coalitions of the conservatives and the liberals. So the ideological alliance, which happened here in May and was thought to be a rather uncomfortable one because people uh, supposed that the Lib Dems would have felt ideologically happier, happier in bed with Labour rather than the Conservatives, that would cause no eyebrows to be raised in much of Northern Europe. I'm not suggesting this is a pattern in Northwestern Europe. This is just the current state of affairs. Now, next question. Are coalitions in general inherently less stable? This slide shows the results of a very big cross-national study comprising 48 countries since the Second World War. And what it shows is that, as one would expect, the most stable form of government, in terms of how long governments last, is indeed single-party majority government. But the next most stable is coalition government, what the experts call a minimal winning coalition, which simply means a coalition composed of the minimum number of parties sufficient to have a majority. And minority government is not much less stable than that kind of coalition government. So in general, coalition government can be relatively stable. Let's move on now to our particular coalition government and consider some factors which might affect its stability. And the first and very important factor is the time taken to form it. And in the week after the election, I got several phone calls from colleagues in Germany who were horrified at this. They thought this was indecent haste to the point of recklessness. How could any government be formed in the space of five days? Here's Germany, average 40 days. In their minds, that's how long it takes to conduct serious negotiations and to agree a coalition agreement. But remember, we were starting from a very different place. The media and public expectations in Britain are that a change of government takes place within 24 hours, famous removal vans in Downing Street. And this year, there was a further set of very heavy pressures 
from the city and the money markets uh, about the possible impact on the pound if we had a prolonged period of uncertainty. So the politicians conducting the negotiations were under those dual pressures, and they were in no doubt that they had relatively little time. And that's why, as we know, uh, they negotiated an agreement in just five days, and they then published a more detailed program for government um, seven days later. So that's the paler red on my chart. 12 days in all before the program for government was published on the 20th of May. And by international standards, the program for government was in fact relatively detailed. Uh, this is detail measured crudely simply by length. And here's ours at 14,000 words. Um, note another reason why the Germans might have been shocked. It's very nice. <laughs> when some national stereotypes are fulfilled, very thorough, the Germans. But as you see, um, we're quite close to a lot of other countries in terms of the length and hence detail. There were 400 separate policy items in the program for government. So in a remarkably short space of time, they did hammer out a relatively detailed agreement. And there was a third document, less noticed, published the next day on the 21st of May by the Cabinet Office, which I call the Coalition's Procedural Agreement. But this slide shows its official title, the Agreement for Stability and Reform. It's much shorter. It's only two or three pages long. And what it sets out is the agreement between the Conservatives and the Lib Dems in terms of how the coalition will be managed. And it says, says at the top that they intend this government to last for five years through until May 2015, that all their relations with each other in the government will be based on goodwill, mutual trust, and agreed procedures, what in New Zealand has been summarized very well as a doctrine of good faith and no surprises. And in particular, everything in an effective coalition depends on very close consultation and a high degree of trust between the Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister. And we know that there is a good relationship between Cameron and Clegg, and I don't think that's just PR, I think that's genuine. They do get on very well together. My main concern uh, about the consultation between them and the coalition agreement formally provides that every document or piece of information that goes into number 10 has to go to the Deputy Prime Minister as well, is whether Clegg and his office have the capacity to handle the volume of that daily and weekly traffic because number 10 is a big, well-established machine uh, with about 150 people. By international standards, it's very small for a head of government's office. But by comparison with Clegg's office, where his private office has just four senior officials and he has four special advisors, um, he has a very tiny staff and resources available to him to cope with that enormous daily influx of stuff. Recently, just last month, his office has been slightly strengthened in that a more senior official, Chris Wormald, the Director General in charge of the Economic and Domestic Affairs Secretariat in the Cabinet Office, has been made formally its head. But Chris Wormald still has his day job as DG in charge of the Economic and Domestic Affairs Secretariat, so he's going to be jolly busy doing that, and I think this is slightly token. And Clegg has also been, in effect, assigned about four policy advisors in number 10 who are his, his kind of uh, seconded policy unit, but they're still based in number 10. It's still very small by comparison with the resources available to the Prime Minister. And I think Whitehall has a genuine difficulty in coming to terms with the idea of two centers of power 
at the center because Whitehall is so used to the center being number 10. And I think it's difficult for number 10 themselves voluntarily, deliberately to create another big center of power, which inevitably, to some extent, they might see as an alternative power center. So, um, so far so good, but as I say, there are concerns, I think, about whether Clegg and his office can keep up their end of the coalition, or whether when stuff goes into the deputy PM, it disappears, and his office risks becoming a black hole. No. No, we did come to that. Uh, briefly, just to finish on the coalition procedural agreement um, and the structure of cabinet committees, we have a new uh, top cabinet committee called the Coalition Committee with equal numbers of Conservatives and Lib Dems, and it's co-chaired by the Prime Minister and Deputy PM. And the Coalition Procedural Agreement says that any unresolved issues can be referred up to the Coalition Committee by the Chair or the Deputy Chair of any Cabinet Committee. And each of those Cabinet Committees has a Chair from one party and a Deputy Chair from the other. And the engine room of the Coalition is the Coalition Operation and Strategic Planning Group, so-called, not formally a Cabinet Committee. And forgive me, there's a mistake on this slide, because the key members of it are Danny Alexander and Oliver Letwin, who were respectively, in effect, the authors, or at any rate, coordinators of the election manifestos of the Lib Dems and the Conservatives. And they were key right-hand men to their party leaders. But you will know, and this is the reason for my mistake here, um, when David Laws, only weeks after the election, uh, was forced to resign, and Danny Alexander replaced him as Chief Secretary to the Treasury, uh, which, especially with planning the expenditure cuts, has been an immensely demanding cabinet job. Danny Alexander, in effect, was no longer available to play his role as coalition manager, and so far as I know, he has not been replaced in that role. So that is another important gap on the Lib Dem side in terms of coalition management. But it may be the hope is that Lords, uh, if he's exonerated by the Parliamentary Standards Inquiry, will return to the government, um, and then maybe Danny Alexander might return to his coalition manager role. Last slide uh, about this coalition and how it will, it will be managed. And these are the arrangements in Parliament, where, again, the agreement formally uh, commits both parties to support all government policy and legislation, save on four particular topics where they have agreed to disagree. The same whip applies to both parties, and they have, in effect, a partly shared whip's office. And in the House of Lords, uh, the same rules apply, so all government business uh, will be whipped on both parties in the Lords. And that's interesting because in the House of Lords under the last government, there was no overall majority for any party, and indeed the last government was regularly defeated in the House of Lords. The work of my colleague, Meg Russell, has shown how under the Labour government from 1997 to 2010, the uh, government was defeated over 500 times in the House of Lords, compared with only five defeats in the same period in the House of Commons. So the Lords was a very effective check in particular, in terms of scrutiny of government legislation. But the Lib Dems, who have the key pivotal votes in the House of Lords, are now committed by the coalition agreement to supporting the new government. And so I wait to see uh, whether the Lords will defeat this government as frequently as they defeated the last. But the early signs uh, are possibly promising in that the government did suffer three defeats um, in the summer months. Now, I'm going to talk next about three key constitutional reforms uh, which are part of this government's agenda. And on all of these, the policy lead rests with Nick Clegg uh, as the deputy PM, um, because 
most of this agenda is a Lib Dem agenda, including this first item, fixed term parliaments. The argument for fixed term parliaments is that they deny the incumbent government the right to set the date of the election to suit its own electoral advantage. And there's a secondary argument that they might permit greater stability and predictability in terms of the conduct of government, because if we all knew well in advance the date of the next election, it would allow for better planning and longer term decision making. But two main issues uh, need to be resolved. One, the length of the fixed term, and secondly, how do you provide a safety valve to allow for an early dissolution of parliament if the government becomes completely ineffective or parliament itself becomes deadlocked. On the length of the fixed term, the point I want to make on this slide is that five years, the term that the government has gone for, is by international and by Westminster standards long. In New Zealand and Australia, they have maximum terms of three years. Many politicians and officials in those countries would wish it were otherwise, um, but uh, three years is the max there. In those parts of the Westminster world, uh, outside Great Britain, where they have introduced fixed terms, and it is a growing phenomenon, they have all opted for four years. So in Canada, at the federal level, they have a fixed four-year term, and in those Canadian provinces, uh, and similarly in those Australian states that have gone for fixed terms. And here in Great Britain, in the UK, I should say, where we have introduced fixed terms, um, which we did 10 years ago in the devolution legislation, we also went for four years. And in continental Europe, where there are about 15 countries that have fixed term regimes, uh, a dozen of those 15 have gone for four years. So four years is a pretty strong international norm, and five years uh, is long by international standards. What about the safety valve for midterm dissolution? Well, you may remember that there was a terrible hoo-ha in the summer um, when the government initially proposed a 55% threshold before the government itself might seek a dissolution of parliament, in part because the 55% seemed uncannily close to uh, the government's own majority in parliament, which I think technically is 56%. Um, and they've since amended that bit of the policy, and they now propose that before the government can uh, propose a dissolution of parliament, it needs to carry a 67% vote, which would require very substantial cross-party support. But the traditional rules for no confidence motions introduced by opposition parties remain the same, with a 50% threshold. And the bill uh, before parliament at the moment provides that if after a successful no confidence motion, no alternative government has been formed within 14 days, then parliament is automatically dissolved and fresh elections held. My question is whether this is all unnecessarily complicated. I'm not yet convinced that we need a dual threshold. And again, if you look around most of the rest of Europe, where they have fixed term laws, they have a single threshold for triggering a midterm dissolution. It's either a simple or an absolute majority. And we don't have time to dwell on my last point. Let us move on. The next uh, big constitutional reform, where again the Lib Dems are in the lead, is their plan for a referendum in six months' time, next May, on electoral reform. And it is in this bill, whose formal title is the Parliamentary Voting System and Constituencies Bill, introduced in July, and it had its second reading in September and its committee stage last month. There's a nice irony in terms of the voting system proposed, because we all know the Conservatives are staunch supporters of First Past the Post. The Lib Dems have been long-standing supporters of STV. And at the last election, the only party which proposed a referendum on the alternative vote, AV, was the Labour Party, um, the party now in opposition. 
But this is all part of the compromises in the coalition agreement, and the agreement commits both parties to support the bill, uh, which they've done so far uh, in the House of Commons and in the Lords. But come the time of the referendum, they will be free to campaign on opposing sides. And there is a political deal at the heart of this bill, which combines two separate policies. Um, I'll talk about uh, the second one in a moment. Namely, that the Lib Dems were terribly keen to hold an early referendum, and the Conservatives were very keen to make an early start on reducing the size of the House of Commons. Will the referendum be won? Well, electoral reformers fondly suppose that if only the public are given the chance to vote for a better voting system, of course they will. I think that is very naive. Voters know nothing about electoral systems. I've done research on that. That's something I can say quite confidently. And they care even less. <laughs> and it is seriously difficult to explain the difference between first past the post and AV. Why? AV is not a proportional voting system. It's a preferential one. And if you replay the last election under AV, which is not an easy thing to do, it requires guesswork, and these are not my figures, um, but it is guessed that at the last election, AV might have given uh, the Lib Dems 20 more seats and the Conservatives 20 less. So it's not a very big difference. And come the referendum, there will be a welter of argument and counter-argument, which I think risks leaving the voting public thoroughly confused, not least because there is seriously little time allowed to try to educate and inform the public. The government hopes that it will get its bill passed by the end of January. And that leaves just three months for public education and information before the referendum in the first week in May. My hunch is that the public, if they're still confused, and the best slogan for the no campaign will be, if you don't know, vote no. And if the public do vote no, they will do what the public did in two provinces in Canada, namely Ontario and British Columbia, where in the last five years they have held referendums on electoral reform, starting, I have to say, from much more propitious circumstances from the point of view of the electoral reformers, and in both cases the proposition was defeated. Reducing the size of the House of Commons is the third constitutional reform, and this is in the same bill as the referendum on AV, and the plan is to reduce it from 650 MPs to 600. That requires a wholesale review of all parliamentary constituency boundaries. The difficulty is how to do that in the life of just one parliament, given that previous boundary reviews have lasted a terribly long time. The last one ran from 2000 to 2008. So the bill says we're going to drastically streamline this process. We're going to abolish the whole system of local inquiries, and the Conservatives also want much more equal-sized constituencies with a tolerance of only plus or minus 5%, because they think that will help reduce the bias in the operation of first-past-the-post against them. Now, as it happens, it will reduce some of the bias. The experts estimate maybe about a third, um, but it won't make any difference to the rest, because the rest arises from a more e efficient distribution of votes uh, for Labour and also differential turnout between Labour supporting and Conservative supporting constituencies and changing the rules uh, won't do anything to change those differences in electoral behaviour. Nevertheless, that strong Conservative belief that if they get more equal sized constituencies it will advantage them electorally lends fuel to the accusations that the government is gerrymandering the system. I think those accusations are unfounded, um, but the accusations are flying around, and the Conservative belief that this will help them uh, doesn't help uh, defend themselves against the charges of gerrymandering. So this bill, I think, will have a difficult passage in the Commons, because 
50 MPs, many of whom have only just arrived there, are in effect being invited to sacrifice their seats and compete um, against their colleagues for new constituencies. Um, and in the Lords, I think it will have a difficult passage because I think there will be uh, lots of concerns raised about the changes being made to the parliamentary boundary review process. Now, I'm coming into my last three minutes and my last three slides. So, beginning to sum up, the argument I've been putting to you today is that the possible failure of one or more of these political reforms, in my view, may threaten the future of the coalition. The Lib Dems, and Clegg is clearly on the record on this, entered the coalition in large part to deliver the Lib Dems' long-standing and deeply held agenda of political and constitutional reform. And Clegg uh, has put himself in the lead on that agenda. And if some of those reforms fail, the Lib Dems have only one person to blame. And under Clegg's leadership, they have, in my view, um, gone at it far too quickly with a mad rush into legislation. These two bills were introduced in July uh, with no white paper, no green paper, no public consultation of any kind. They've picked, I think, an unnecessary fight over the five-year term for fixed-term parliaments. The referendum on AV, I think, is highly likely to be lost. They face accusations of gerrymandering the parliamentary boundaries, even though, as I've indicated, I think those accusations are unfair. Um, and Lord's Reform, something I don't have time to go into in my talk, but I'm happy to discuss in questions, which the Lib Dems fondly suppose is only a matter of political will, is far more difficult than that. So, what might happen next? Well, one possibility would be that if the Lib Dems uh, do fail on one or more of these reforms and begin to feel very uncomfortable politically, and it's worth mentioning that the latest opinion poll published today apparently shows the Lib Dems on 9%. Uh, and that may or may not be a rogue poll, but remember they got 24% at the election, so that is a hell of a crash um, just in the first five, six months of this government. That will create big tensions. There are always big tensions for a junior coalition partner. Um, and historically, when the Lib Dems have been involved in coalitions, they have split. Uh, that's a dis slight distortion of the historical record because they, they split in past coalitions more about entry into the coalition um, than about its breakup. But the general point is coalitions create great tensions for political parties, and in particular for the junior partner. A lesser thing the Lib Dems might do is at some stage during the life of this parliament to leave the government, but to continue to support it on supply and confidence. And that would allow them in the run-up to the next election to develop greater distinctiveness vis-a-vis -vis the electorate. And the final point I want to leave you with is the question of whether if in future we do have more hung parliaments, the norm is going to be a coalition government, or whether we might see instead minority government. What will develop as the UK tradition? In continental Europe, as I showed on that earlier slide, coalition government has become very much the norm. But there are some exceptions. Denmark is one where they have hung parliaments, election after election, but for the last 30 years or so, they've had minority government. That's the Danish tradition. And so, in my final slide, this is the British history in the 20th century. And here are the coalition governments. That's the Second World War one, the national government in the 30s, First World War and post-war coalition government. But look, we've also had experience of minority governments. So in the 20th century, there were six minority governments. So what do you think in the future is going to become the British way if we have more hung parliaments? Now, we've got six, seven minutes for questions. 
Um, and if I may, I'd like to take them in groups so we fit in as many as possible. So those who want to ask a question, could you put a hand up? Yes, one there. Does he need a microphone? Yeah. yeah. And if we could have two mics and second question from anyone? Yes, could we have a mic up at the back to that gentleman there? You, sir. <coughs> John Strafford. Um, John Curtis has said that, uh, Professor, Professor Curtis has said that um, if AV does go through uh, and the coalition is successful, the Conservatives and Liberal Democrats will approach the election uh, saying vote one, two, Conservative Lib Dems or Lib Dems Conservatives. And if they do that, both the Conservative Party and the Liberal Democrats will, be, um, will do much better and the, and the one that will actually lose out will be the Labour Party. So wouldn't that make then the Conservatives uh, go soft on their opposition to AV? <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I just wondered why you thought House of Lords um, uh, reform was so difficult. Well, that's a big question. Um, John Strafford's question is a very interesting one about what the tactics will be, all the political parties, if we have AV. Um, and we don't know. Uh, under this coalition, whether towards the end of this parliament, they will remain, as it were, fairly tightly wedded. Um, and even if we don't have a coupon election, um, which means the Conservatives and the Lib Dems having agreements not to stand against each other um, in various seats, nevertheless, there are different uh, forms of alliance between tight and loose. Um, but it all depends, I think, on how unhappy the Lib Dem supporters are with being seen to be getting more firmly into bed with the Conservatives. Um, and it may be that they will want to distance themselves a bit come election time because they may want to uh, maintain the option of maybe negotiating next time and possibly forming a coalition with the Labour Party. I mean, who knows uh, what the electoral fortunes of the Conservatives might be come the next election, and if the Labour Party look as though they might uh, be on track to do better than the Conservatives, um, the Lib Dems don't want to be too closely tied to the Conservatives. Lord's reform, uh, the, the political difficulty is that although formally all three major parties are on the same page in that they are all committed to a largely elected House of Lords, Internally, within each party, they're deeply divided. And so the strength of support for that policy is not strong in any one party. And it's not that strong in the House of Commons. It's often supposed that the main obstacle to Lords' reform is the House of Lords. Not so. Uh, the House of Commons is an equally serious uh, parliamentary chamber that any bill has to get through. And in terms of the detail of proposals for an elected House of Lords, when the Commons are forced to address that and think about the consequences of an elected Lords, something that they don't normally think about, they, many of them will find the uh, possibly stronger and more legitimate House of Lords quite threatening. So I think uh, in the Commons, as well as in the Lords, any bill for an elected Lords would face a very difficult passage. More on this side. Yes, one up at the back. And can we have a second or a third hand? Anyone in the middle? No? You, sir. Um, would the, uh, does the vote on AV indicate to you a, uh, indicate that Parliament is trying to assert itself as a uh, stronger body in, uh, in a way that the devolution and the joining of the EU has uh, taken away some of its power? So the question is, does the vote on AV connect... Represent an assertion of uh, trying to gain some of the power that it's lost in devolution and uh, joining the EU. Right. Thank you. Yes. Um, I wanted to question your view that uh, people are, don't know what AV is. If you take London, we've had mayor elections which have been done on, under a similar system to the AV, and also various other parts of the country. 
you have a mayor's elected there. So people, I'm suggesting some people are aware of it and therefore the, the view that you expressed slightly. Thank you. So, and the third one there, and this is the last round. So anyone else who wants to get in a question, raise a hand. Um, ju just very briefly, I wonder if you could expand on the issue of uh, fixed term parliaments. I think you were saying that you thought the dual threshold was unnecessarily complicated. Uh, and I just thought if you could explain how you think, what, what would be a better approach? Thank you. Um, taking those three, the first question was, um, is there any connection between the proposed referendum on AV and the loss of parliamentary sovereignty because of devolution uh, and the EU? And I don't think there's any connection. Um, no, I think uh, choosing a different voting system um, for the House of Commons is a separate and, and freestanding issue. Um, I was challenged as to whether people are really as ignorant about voting systems um, as I suggested. Well, we did some research on this eight or ten years ago for a commission uh, established by the unit and serviced by us on Britain's experience of new voting systems because we wanted to understand what public attitudes were to the new voting systems in London, in Scotland, in Wales, and to the new voting system for the European parliamentary elections. And I remember being very struck by the evidence that came back of how little people understand about voting systems. Indeed, they don't even understand first past the post. Um, so uh, I would take a small bet with you, sir, that if I had money to do similar research in six months' time, and if we did um, public attitude and public knowledge surveys around the time of the referendum to test public knowledge of voting systems, including AV, uh, my guess is we would get the same pretty depressing result. <coughs> you and I are in a very small and sad minority in being interested in these things. Fixed term parliaments, um, I was asked to say a bit more about the dual threshold and what my answer would be. Well, by raising the question, um, in effect, I think I'm questioning whether there needs to be a dual threshold. Um, the only circumstance in which the 67% threshold for a government-initiated dissolution would bite might be if we were back with single-party majority government, and it would then make it difficult for that government to seek a dissolution midterm on its own. It would need the support of one of the parties on the other side of the House of Commons. And that is one argument for maintaining a higher threshold for a government-initiated dissolution. But otherwise, I would be perfectly comfortable with a single threshold of 50%, uh, whether the proposal for a dissolution comes from the government or from the opposition. Very good, and I looked to my manager, but we are now, I think, at finishing time. I think it is time, so thank you very much, Professor Robert Hazel, for this very insightful lecture, and thank you all for coming today. Thank you.